from the University of Auckland, Dr. Susie Wiles. Susie, thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, thanks for having me. <laughs> hey, very yeah, excited. Not really about... Talk about COVID anymore. <laughs> well, I mean, we're trying to we're trying to find that balance between not being the you know the boogeymen, so to speak, and just the naysayers and the doom breakers, but also giving people information. And look, I'll, I'll give you a, a um, an, an example in my life. Uh, had a child who uh, was going to go off to a school camp last week. And we were a bit concerned about COVID creeping back up. And the school camp has now been seen as a hotspot. 11 cases coming out of it, uh, I would, and I think will will grow from there. So, uh, yeah, so it's still real. It's still out there. My my co-host on the Sometimes Chewy was down two weeks ago with it. I had a regular contributor who's going to come on tonight and talk midterms who's got it at the moment. So, I mean, like, I want to talk about some specifics, but one of the things I wrote down is what the hell do we do? Is this really just going to be with us forever? Yeah. And if it is, is it like just roll the dice? Because I'm I'm a realist and I'm like people just, including me, who I like, we came to Auckland a few weeks ago, I wore a mask up in the plane and a mask back in the plane. And when I go to the supermarket, I still pop it on and pop it off, you know. Um, but if this was literally with us forever, I'm not going to, keep doing that it's i'm just being a realist that that's going to stop at some stage even for me who's probably a bit more cautious than most so what what the hell are we supposed to do what are we doing what what can we do so i guess the question is why would you stop wearing a mask in in situations where it's uh you know you're at increased risk it's kind of an yeah. interesting thing right because we you know we wear a seat belt every time we get in the car and we wouldn't really even think twice about about taking that away as a protection right so it's sort of interesting how how some things we we grow to live with and others at the moment we're feeling like we can't. Whereas if you look at lots of other countries like in Asia and things, you know, mask wearing is just, it's just something they're now very used to. You know, yeah. it's a, um, people often do it if they're feeling a little bit under the weather as a, as a sign of respect that, you know, in case I do have something, I'm going to, I'm going to protect everybody around me. So it's really interesting that that's something somehow we can't get into that headspace it'd be really nice if yeah. we could <laughs> yeah no i think um, i think you're right because i think i think i'm i might sound like a bit of a defeatist but i'm also being a realist like i just know that you know i mean i'm still not necessarily eating indoors at cafes and stuff but we're coming into summer so that's okay but i'm i'm not going to avoid that for the rest of my life so i guess i'm just being a bit of a realist and going at some stage it's going to go away uh, maybe not a hundred percent but certainly not you know, as as it is for some people still now, and certainly not what it was six months ago. And I guess I'm I'm feeling a bit depressed about the whole thing. You know, I I I, we, I said we're going to talk about this as well. You know, the ship. Let me bring it up. I'm sure people have uh, have heard about this, but the ship that circumnavigated New Zealand and then went into Australia, and when it docked in Sydney, it had 800 cases of COVID on it. When it docked, that was one in five people on the ship, on the cruise had COVID and um, I won't play the video now in fact because we're pre-recording this I've probably played it before we came to you um, mm -hmm. is that the people got off the got off the boat in, in Sydney and went about their lives you know obviously they're being asked to isolate and that sort of thing but it's just like oh well we've got COVID we're now we're now disembarking the the boat and going back into the community and when I saw that I'm just like well what the fuck it's like you know what are we <laughs> what are those of us who have taken some precautions who, who in, in an ideal world wouldn't get it, but not, but also being a realist, going, you know, most people seem to have got it by now. We just, is, at what, what point do we give up? And I'm, and I, I like I said, I, I agree with what you're saying about why would people stop, but I guess I'm being a realist on the same level and go, what's, what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to approach this from here on in? Okay. So I guess the first thing to say is that it does appear to be with us <laughs> and, and you're right. I mean, it's it's it shows no sign of going anywhere. So I guess the you know what I hold hope for is that um, we will have at some point in the future an, a vaccine that actually does a, a better job of um, of stopping transmission. So you know there are still quite a lot of vaccines in clinical trials. Yeah. Um, the, the ones that we hope will make the big difference are the um, intranasal vaccines. So the idea is that if we can mount a better immune response in our nose and throat, you right. know, that will help um, uh, reduce transmission a lot. So we're kind of looking for, you know, an intranasal vaccine and then preferably one that is, um, you know, going to work against uh, uh, all of these new, you know, new and emerging and, and, and future variants. Um, again, something that's being worked on, a, a pan 
coronavirus type vaccine. So who knows, you know, if we think about the amazing strides that were made in, you know, in the time since COVID appeared, right? Incredible yeah. progress. I mean, it's definitely slowed now because the money has gone. <laughs> but that's not to say that these things aren't there. So that's kind of that's what I'm holding as a, you know, that would be really, that would be really nice. Um, but we do know that, you know, that we we have measures that will will reduce transmission, right? So masks. But what we also know is the public health measures that work the best. So the one the ones that are kind of invisible, right? They're the ones that we don't really realize are even working. And so when you've got an airborne infection, it's it's about cleaning the air and getting rid of the virus from the air. That's the kind of invisible thing, right? Yeah, yeah. And so what we really should be doing is completely rethinking, you know, indoor air you know, really looking at ventilation, um, monitoring air so we know what the ventilation's like uh, in all the places that we can, you know, and certainly moving forward in new builds, you know, be thinking about how do mm. we basically make sure ventilation is up to scratch. And in places where it's not up to scratch, how can we use things like air purification uh, to, to help get it, right? So, so it's really, I think, rather than feeling defeatist, we should be coming together and saying, actually, this is not good enough. Like there's loads of stuff we could be doing and we need to do it. So that's my call to action to you is that, is that we actually, we can do this. You know, we did a great job of coming together collectively at the beginning of a pandemic. We've kind of lost that collective action now, but we can yeah. totally do it again. Um, and, you know, the, the kinds of things I'm talking about, they won't just be good for COVID. They'll be good for all sorts of other respiratory diseases and probably things like asthma and, you know, hay fever, all of those kinds of things. So um, it's there. <laughs> we could do it. <laughs> hey, um, I, I've just I, I haven't got this prepared for this, but I because we're recording this and I'll play it out on tonight's show. So when people see this, it'll be hi, we're live. Um, but I've actually got this 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 thing in my house. I'm part of a study looking at the air quality of a house. And it actually tra tracks the CO2 level in the house. And I've got a real-time tracker. And I'll what I'll do is I'll, I'll take a screen grab of that. I'll take off all my address and all that kind of thing. And I'll, um, and I'll show it after we're finished talking here. Because it's really interesting to see as well when you're talking about air quality. In the middle of the night, when we're all asleep, um, and this is in the hallway, so it's not in anyone's bedroom, it goes up above 800 parts per million. Yeah. which is the magical number that if it's above 800 parts per million, you're supposed to open the doors and 300 parts per million is outside. And it's really interesting to see that. And it's, it's given me that the point that you're making about what would, how would you design a house that in the middle of the night when everyone's asleep and expelling carbon dioxide, you could still keep it below 800 parts per million. Remembering that this, this, uh, this meter is not in a bedroom, it's in the hallway. So imagine what that is in the bedrooms. Who knows? But mm. it's got to be way above that. So, yeah, I think it's a really good point. Also, I wanted to ask you this. I've got a little clip to play you. And look, correct me if I'm wrong, but we've been speaking to you and, you know, Anna Brooks and Michael Plank and all these people all the way through this, well, all the way through this since we've been doing this daily news news conversation, is the, the message is still coming from out from the media to me, still feels so muddled. And I'll just play just one sentence. This is a report on the cruise ship, but I just want to play you a quick thing that the reporter says. Australia is currently facing its fourth wave of COVID, with there no longer being a requirement to isolate when positive. But when it comes to boarding cruise ships, there are still very strict rules. You need to have the negative test and be double vaccinated. So how this outbreak started remains a mystery. That, that exact point. It's like, well, we don't know how this happened. Happened. she's basically saying they're double vaccinated they should be protected so how did this happen and the message that i know i think and this is the thing it gets confusing because you hear that in the media that's from this weekend so that message is from this weekend not from 15 months ago <laughs> is that the current vaccine <laughs> ba5 gets past it but it keeps you proportionally from going to hospital but you've got reporters still saying Cha. Would they, would there's no understanding as to how these people caught it because they're all double vaccinated. So even the messaging to me is like, what are you talking about? The messaging's not right even today. Yeah. Well, and, you know, and and the other point is, so we, we've known <laughs> since Delta, right, the, the vaccines were amazing against Delta. Yeah. Um, and, and then when Omicron came along, you know, that was when we saw a huge spike because 
the Omicron variant is in, incredibly immune evasive, right? It can infect people who've been vaccinated and who's, who've had a previous infection. But the other thing is that we know that the tests are a measure of how much virus you are basically shedding at that moment in time. And so, you know, saying that people need a negative test to get on the ship is great. But yeah. if they're incubating the virus and test positive the next day, well, then they're infectious. You know, and the other thing I found really interesting about the cruise ships is that they are doing a five day isolation. So if somebody tests positive, they will isolate on board for five days and then basically they're free to go. And what we know really clearly from the data is that a huge portion of people will still be positive at day five, will still be positive at day seven, right? Which is when, when we can leave isolation here in New Zealand. Yeah. And in fact, some of them will still be positive at about day 10. So what we really should be doing is a test at the end <laughs> to say, are you still infectious or are you not infectious, right? Um, and and then, you know, if you are infectious, well, preferably people should be isolating for longer. And if they're not going to isolate, they should be wearing masks, right, to help try and reduce the amount that they are shedding. So it is no surprise to me at all that there have been 800 people, uh, you know, infectious on that boat because because there will, there will be people who were incubating the virus who got on the boat. And then because people are allowed to move around when infectious because they only isolate for five days, it will be transmitting. That's just, that's, none of this is mysterious. <laughs> and, and what worries me, you know, there's, there's two things that worry me, me about the cruise ship. So one is that, um, you know, on board, <laughs> that, that, that that's it, right? You, you're kind yeah. of, um, you're, you're on board and, uh, you know, and, and there will be people infectious wandering around. So if they're not doing, if they're not masking or anything like that, then that means they'll be spread. Um, but also, you know, when <laughs> when the cruise ship arrives and then just just gorges its passengers, um, you know, that's that's. I mean, I was thinking, you know, the, that boat was recently in the Bay of Islands. Yep. And so, you know, and and a lot of people who will be getting off the boat are likely infectious. And so, it worries me about small places getting a mm. huge influx of infectious people yeah. then going around and doing things. So, you know, we know this virus is circulating, you know, we know that there are cases in Northland, but it's very different to <laughs> several hundred people in one day okay, going, today's the day we're all yeah. going to go and visit your little town. Um, and, you know, and and this, the frightening thing is that, you know, for small places where it might be difficult to access healthcare. You know that, that might end up with a surge of cases that um, that you know become very different, difficult to look after people, right? And even you know, even if we put, forget the you know the impact on health, just having people out sick for a couple of weeks yeah. again, when you've got a small town, will have a massive impact on the infrastructure of that town, right? On the businesses. You know, if, if you've suddenly got everybody in the cafe or everybody in the high street who's now infected, and you know, because we do still isolate people here, rightly so. I mean, that's the you know, at least that's one protection we still have. Um, but that has a massive, inf uh, you know, um, impact on on places. So, uh, yeah, frustrating. When we, were when we were talking to Dr. Anna last week, she referred to the cruise ships as. Um, floating petri dishes which i thought was quite a good way of uh, thinking about it she also which I think they've always been right i mean yeah. they've always had things like norovirus outbreaks yeah. you know um and i think it's also really interesting you know given many of the demographics of you know the kind of people who like the to older, go on older people yeah cruises and stuff um it's it, i find it amazing that again you know there's lots of things that could be done to help reduce transmission even more but people don't you know they're not going on a cruise to be isolated for their cruise because they're infectious um yeah so i mean these are these are hard these are hard problems but if we're going to have this issue with us for the considerable future I feel yeah. like we should be doing a better job of trying to solve them right um, the other thing that Anna spoke about, which you're spoken about, is basically testing to exit, because uh, I I made some kind of you know not quite fully informed decision of a comment I should say where I said, but hang on, you can you know like two weeks later or a week later you can still be testing positive within your system. Can't you have it in your system? What 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 is it what is it called when you have it in your system? She goes, yeah, you've got it in your system because you've got COVID. 
and he says, and I'm like, oh, okay. Well, it's sort of, it was quite blunt and it was the test to exit thing was, was really hammered home here last week. And like you're saying, if they're just basically saying five days in, you can go without mm -hmm. doing a test out of the things that's um out of the, out of their rooms, that's, it's that's all, just going to keep also, it going around. I think it's, I think it's worth remembering that um, the, the, you know, things have obviously changed a lot, right? And when we were using the PCR test, people can test positive by PCR for months. And that's because the PCR test is both very sensitive, but also picks up little bits of, you know, viral debris, right? So it's not picking up infectious virus. Yeah. Whereas the rapid antigen tests are very different. They are mm. picking up the virus. Right. And so, you know, that's why if you are still testing positive, uh, you know, a week or two later, that is infectious virus. The right. important thing, well, though, is after you get, once you get to about two weeks, that's when your body is starting to make its own antibodies. And so at that stage, you will still be shedding virus, but it's probably being neutralized by your antibodies. So there sort of reaches this point where um, you're positive, but probably not infectious. But I would say that is not, <laughs> that is not at day seven. That's not at day five, right? It's, um, it's much, much later. Uh, but it's very, it's what's really frustrating is that there's still, um, you know, I've, I've had people message me saying they've called Healthline and Healthline are going, oh, no, you don't need to do another test because, you know, if you're positive, you're not infectious. And it's like, no, that's that's data that, you know, or, or an understanding that belongs to the days when we did PCR. It's not true nowadays. So it's kind of frustrating that people are getting, um, you know, bad information. The other thing that we just should stress again, I'm sure Anna stressed yep. this, um, is that it's really important that when people do um, a rapid antigen test, they swab their throat as well as their nose because okay. we know that a lot of people um, can uh, will have it in their throat but not in their nose. So they'll be infectious, but if you only do a nasal swab, basically you'll test negative. And so this is it's really easy to do. You can you just use the same swab. I would recommend you do your throat first and then your nose <laughs> rather than the other way around. But you basically just pop it in your mouth and you just rub like the sides of your cheeks kind of at the back. You don't sort of jab it at your throat. You just kind of rub around the back, do it a few times, and then you shove it in your nose and do it. And the number of people who are messaging me, you know, their rat results, nose only, nose and throat, and the nose and throat is the only one that's positive. Wow. And it just makes me think how many people will be wandering around actually genuinely thinking they're negative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's because, you know, the tests tell you only do your nose. And it's like, the, the the instructions of the tests are so bad too. <laughs> hey, um, let's have a look at today. Uh, today just released this afternoon, twenty one thousand five ninety five new community cases. Now that sounds fantastic because that's three thousand cases a day. The last two weeks have been twenty thousand something, so it sounds like it's not going up. But when you have a look at the things like the wastewater graphs and that, uh, you kind of look back to when they were at a similar level, and it was it was June ish. And at June-ish, yeah. there was a lot more cases per day than 3,000. So if you use the wastewater sampling, it's more than uh, than the 21,595 we're reporting um, because we, people, are know, yeah. people are getting sick and not people are getting sick and not reporting. Um, so it'll be it'll be a selection of things, right? It'll be people who are testing themselves and testing negative because they're not doing their throat, or they might be doing it a bit too early and they need to do it a couple of days later. Right. And then there'll be people who are just who are testing but not reporting their results and then there will be people who are not testing at all right and all of those things together we've known we've known they've all been happening <laughs> and we know that they mean that we won't you know we don't have the correct case numbers but that's why the wastewater results are really good to follow because there are you know most places are on you know at least is our waste is going into the <laughs> municipal waste so um they are quite a good measure of that um but yeah, and that's the one to watch. And I would be watching it like for your region, right? Because we also yeah. know that the region's a little bit different because the outbreak outbreaks are happening in slightly different places. And so, you know, we know that Wellington was a real hot spot a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> it's probably moved somewhere else now. So I, that's the thing that I watch to, to decide how, you know, how am I going to behave? What sort of things am I going to do by watching that? And just to show people, like, because obviously we're Dunedin proud, our wastewater at the moment is at 6.57 million, and our cases, they say, are 180. I'm assuming the cases is what's been reported. But if you go back to the last time, it was that number where, where I, uh, we were reporting a bit better, which is around here, 7.6 million, uh, 5.4 million. The cases are 360. So the cases are double 
what they're being reported today. So, so uh, we talked to Michael Plank last week as well. This is the this is the place to be if you want to talk COVID, Susie. We do it all day, <laughs> not quite all day, but Michael Plank and uh, oh, no, sorry, David Welsh. It was David Welsh who was saying, you know, double is the minimum, and he was suggesting that perhaps twenty thousand cases in the week could have been between forty and fifty, and those those numbers kind of bear out. And if it was fifty thousand, if it was, that's seven thousand cases a day, and when we were seven thousand cases a day, we'd we'd far more government direction as to what we should do to keep ourselves safe. And now the government's gone. Which brings me to my last question, Susie. If for some reason you had the Prime Minister's ear um, and, you know, she actually said to you, what should we be doing? We would like your advice, Susie. What would you be advising the government right now, like right now to get that mix of protecting people from COVID, opening up business, uh, uh, needing to be able to have tourism? What, what should we be doing? Have we found the balance? Do we need to change something slightly? What would you advise? Look, I, I so I'm going to get to my advice in a minute, but I think the government are actually in a really difficult position, right? Because we, you know, if we think about what happened um, back in February um, with the protests, you know, we have got, um, we've got a very difficult situation where there are people who are stirring up hatred and violence, you know, um, against any public health measures, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And they're using that as a kind of real a, a, a way to try and really interfere in our democracy, you know, like really they're doing all sorts of really crazy stuff, right? And so I think that the government are probably trying to manage how to keep us safe and how to, you know, how to keep the economy going with also, with also protecting social cohesion, right? When you have these very, very bad actors who are, using anything we do as a way to interfere in in as i say in our democracy that's not a that's not hyperbole right there's been yeah, a couple yeah. of really really good documentaries out recently that have really shown what what is at stake so i'm really glad i don't have to make these decisions that i'm not in a position <laughs> of power where i'm having to balance all these things you know and i've got business leaders yelling that they want like you know they don't want people isolating and you've got you know, media screaming about the fact the pandemic's over everywhere else when it's very clearly not, right? So uh, I'm glad I'm not in charge. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, what do we need? Well, we need, we do need a test to release strategy, right? So we need to keep isolation and we do need for people to be testing. We do need the really good information out about when people are infectious, how they, you know, how they limit transmission, at least outside of their own homes, um, you know, we really, we really do need a really good campaign on masking, like to, to get that kind of, do you know what, this is actually a super duper thing that that does work really, really well, and will reduce cases, right. Um, and then and then we need that really concerted effort, I think this real collaboration between government and between businesses, on how do we sort out our air? How do we do mm. that, right? Government, can clearly, you know, uh, can clearly kind of push things and provide good advice. But it is something that I wish more businesses were taking up because this is this is about the the safety of their customers and their staff. And so, from a health and safety perspective, this is actually something that every business should be thinking about and doing more, you know, more about. So, I think it should be a collaboration rather than. Um, you know, edicts from on high, because mm -hmm. as we've seen, edicts from on high, no matter how much good they're trying to do, there are those, you know, people who for their own reasons are using that to um, basically try and, you know, destroy our social cohesion. So I think it needs to be a real collaboration. And we need to get back to that feeling we had that we all had a common goal to care for each other to care for our well-being, to care for our economy, right? We need to get back to that because there's stuff that we could be doing. And it's kind of, you know, I mean, it's ironic that having that opinion means that people like me, you know, there, there are people out there who want people like me executed. And that's, that's, where, that's where this has got to, right? Madness. Um, it is madness. And we need to, I think we need to talk about that more. And we need to talk about actually the great job that we did that got us here, you know, and it is frustrating for those of us who are trying to still avoid getting it and don't want long COVID and don't want to have a heart attack in the next six months or whatever, you know, don't want to have a stroke. 
I think we need to recapture the fact that things work better when we work together. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And it's that be, not- it's that, but it's that be kind thing as well. Like, you know, and also it's, I, I mean, I wear, I've got masks kind of floating around the house that I'm, that I wear, I wear them in the car. And I came back from Auckland and I had a, I had a cold and I did all the testing and it was just a cold, but it was, all, it was a freaking awful cold. And <laughs> so one of the reasons I was wearing the mask when I felt well enough to go to the supermarket was exactly that. It was, I, I didn't want to mm. pass it on to other people. And I watched the all black game in Tokyo and I feel a little bit jealous because like 80% of the crowd have got masks on because that's just, it's always been a part of the culture. We used to kind of go, that's a bit weird. Hey, eh? you go to Japan and they're wearing masks in the street. And it's now like, now it's like, gosh, I wish we'd be like Japan and wear masks in the street. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. anyway. Hey, but, you um, know, it can, it, it can happen, right? You know, if we think back to the early days of seatbelts, you know, if we think back to the early days of anything, right? So, <laughs> anti-smoking measures, there were always very, very vocal groups that were very anti them, right? Often being driven by people with alternative agendas. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, with the same thing is happening here. Um, it's quite scary. Uh, and and it doesn't have to be that way, I think. And so we have to remember, you know, that when like when I'm wear when I, I wear a mask when I'm out, I'm not just wearing it for me, I'm wearing it for others. And the number of people who've come up to me and said, Thank you for wearing a mask. It makes me feel more comfortable knowing that you are at wearing one, knowing that, you know, that actually, you know, when, when I'm at the supermarket, right? Probably a place of low transmission, but the staff really appreciate it because it's a signal mm. that you care about them as well as caring about your own health. Hey, Susie Wiles, thanks for joining us today. Really appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.